the trail again and again. Hiking and hunting and fishing the land. Time is time we'll spend. We'll take it to the Delta. Welcome to Mississippi Outdoors. I'm Pamela Weaver. And I'm Kevin Meacham. Thanks for joining us. And our first story, we're headed to Tallahatchie County. The outdoor crew is quail hunting at Trout Valley Quail Preserve. Let's go. So today we're in Tallahatchie County at Trout Valley Quail Preserve and uh, we're going to take uh, a little time today to let the guide shoot a little bit. This is my father Bud Trout and my friend Nat Martin and I uh, ho hope to get some good shooting in today. My first bird dog was in 2010. We opened, we had our first hunt in 2011 and uh, we've been growing steadily ever since. Enjoy working with bird dogs, enjoy meeting people from all over. You know, we've had people from as far away as Alaska and England and South Africa. So it's uh, all over the United States. So it's a lot of fun to meet all these different people and get them out and, and show them a good time. Good job. Dead. Dead bird. Dick out here. Another thing that happens a lot with Mississippians here is, you know, we just about skipped a generation of quail hunters in the state because of the decimation of wild birds. Uh, so to bring that back has allowed a lot of fathers and grandfathers to bring their sons and grandsons out to uh, enjoy the sport they grew up doing. Uh, just yesterday we had a, I think he was 82 or 83 years old, brought his son and grandson out here for the, their first bird hunt. So they had never seen a bird dog work, they had never seen a quail flush, they would certainly never shot at one, and uh, yesterday they got to see what their grandfather and father grew up, grew up doing. So it was, uh, those kind of things make it special for a lot of people because kind of pass that torch down. Come here Lily, Lily, Lily. It did, okay, I thought. Let's, let's take him down here where Nat had that bird go down there. You find it? Yep. You did? Yep. Okay. It flew, all, I mean, it flew it, like it was fine. Yeah. It just out of nowhere dropped. It's the old silent killer shot. That's right. I thought I thought it was hit. Come here, Vic. Come, Vic. Right here. Yeah. Good boy. Good boy. Oh, 
Matt, you miss that big old thing. <laughs> and uh, the first bird we shot over, she retrieved it to hand. And she's just been a natural retriever ever since. And you've seen her today, she just brings it, puts it right in your hand, and goes back and hunts. Dead in there, Sean. Dead in there, Sean. Fetch it up. Fetch it up, that a boy. Come. Hey, Sean. Yeah, good boy. Good boy. He's got something over there. You see it, bird? I do. Whoa, whoa, Lily. Whoa. Good shot. Come on, Lily. Good girl, Lily. Yes, good girl. Bird hunting is, for me and most people, I think, all about the dogs. It's about the dogs, not about shooting birds, and although that's part of it, but it's watching the dogs work. And, uh, it, you know, it's just fun to watch them. And uh, particularly if they're moving and they lock up, you know, they just turn and they lock up on point. And uh, it's just really, really enjoyable watching the dogs. Huh? And he's got, he's had some really good dogs. He, he's really fortunate. He's got a, uh, he got a really good trainer that helps him with them and, and uh, he works with them pretty hard. And, so he's ended up some really good, really good dogs. They got that um, relationship with Mike Flock, how that she hunts, and uh, he, you know he's built it from nothing. He did it all himself. Now he's still barn shells from it. Here. Used to you'd be on a hunt with your son and dog would point. Son would say, Daddy, stay on point. You want to come here and take his shot? Now they say, he's on point. Y'all be ready. Yeah, be ready in case it happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've already hunted half of this, so we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to pick that bird up. Good shot. Come on, Lily. Oh, yeah. Good girl. Come on, Lily. Good girl. Good girl. Yeah, good girl. I think you hit that. Oh. Good shot. Good shot. Oh yeah. Take it. <clears throat> Good shot. So I was able to kind of, I think immediately offer, once we, once we got to where we could open, immediately offer people something they would enjoy doing. They, they were shot dead but cleared. Yeah. 
Yeah. Good girl, really. Good girl. Right there, man. Shot. No. Shine, come on. Did you know that money spent on Mississippi hunting and fishing license is just like an investment? The Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks uses money from license sales to enhance hunting and fishing, like providing public hunting opportunities on wildlife management areas, advising private landowners on deer and habitat management, providing public fishing opportunities on state lakes, and operating fish hatcheries for stocking public lakes and streams. So make an investment in the great outdoors. Buy your Mississippi hunting and fishing license today. In our next story, we're headed to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. The outdoors crew takes a look at oyster production in the Gulf of Mexico. Now tell me a little bit about oyster production and what is the best time of year to start with and why? Well, the best time to start planting with is, I, I like April, May, and June. That, to me, that's the best three months because you get the best spat catches. The spat is the young oyster. When they spat into the water, it's just nothing but eggs. They look like little tadpoles, microscopic tadpoles, and they float in the, the, the current. And then after about two weeks, they set down. So if you don't have the rocks down, there's nothing going to set on They die if they hit mud. They won't go back up. So you want your rocks clean. So you want to put them in April, May, and June so you get your best sets. We're here at Bayou Caddy at Bayou Caddy Fisheries. We're going oyster bedding with Captain Ray on the Cindy Sea. This is how oyster production is done here on the coast now. Uh, all of our reefs are pretty much depleted. Uh, so it's all man-made. You eat oysters, this is how it happens. Captain Ray and Michael actually loading their used oyster shells. Once the shells go to the shucking houses, they're returned back and then made in back into reefs. Uh, for every oyster shell you see here, more than likely you're gonna have an oyster when they get ready to harvest in two years. It takes two years before these shells are turned back into mature oysters for harvest. What do you mainly use for oyster bedding? I use concrete and shells. A lot of people use limestone, but concrete seems to be the best because it's more porous and it, it gets better spat catch. Where do you put the rock? Can you just put it anywhere? No, you have, to, you have to find bottom that is a firm bottom and you want some current. You want to have a good bottom, the bottom's got to be firm. So you want a naturally either shell bottom or sandy bottom? You, you can, it's got to be a sandy clay bottom. It can't be sand because they'll sink into sand also. It's got to be a sandy clay. You're limited to the bottom that you can use. Once you put your rocks down, how long do you expect before you can harvest those oysters? It's average two, two and a half, three years. From, time from, from the time that harvest. they spat to the time that you can harvest them, the three inch oyster. Now generally, what is your return on the amount of rocks that you put out to what you can harvest? It varies. If you have a good set, you put down a thousand tons of rocks, you get 20,000 sacks of oysters back which is a good return. We find the bottom that we want, we stake it off real good so that we concentrate our oyster shells, and rocks, whatever, on the best bottoms. The gates open up, we use the fire engine nozzles to wash them overboard and that, that gets them all spread out nice because you don't want to make clumps. They got to be spread. It's, it's, a, it's a delicate situation when you're putting them down because it can't be too thick, it can't be too thin. What I do is I'll make a small circle and extend the circle out, and then I'll go long ways back on it one way, and then I'll crisscross that afterwards with the second or third load so that you get a good even spread on the bottom. Usually you get maybe two harvests off of it before you have to replant it, before you have to go back over it. You'll get one good season, then the next season will be 
not quite as good, and after that you have to re-rock it. Well, to start off, we need to collect brood stock, which are our adult oysters, in order to spawn out the larva. We go to different local reefs within the area to collect all these brood stock. We like to go to multiple reefs so that way we can have genetic diversity. Once we've collected our brood stock, we bring them in and hold them in our floating cages, pumped in and fed by bayou water. When we're ready to spawn out, we look for the amount of gonads within the brood stock. We can know this by seeing the canals within the gonadal area of the brood stock itself. Once we've collected and determined which ones are good to go, we bring them over here and we dip them in a freshwater bath. We do this to get any external parasites or bacteria or any other things we don't want in our system. Oysters are induced to spawn by temperature change, a lot of feed, so we try to induce them to spawn by high temperatures. So right now we have it at 31 degrees C, and if we don't get a response, then we'll kind of bump that up again. But a lot of times if they get a nice dose of warm water, then it'll trigger one of the oysters to spawn. And once we get a male to spawn, then sometimes we'll utilize that sperm to kind of initiate the rest of the oysters to release their gametes as well. Once we have a good percentage of males, females that have released their gametes, then we do the fertilization. Once we determine the sex of the brood stock themselves, by then releasing the gametes in the water, we separate out the males and the females. Bradley is getting ready to fertilize the eggs that we collected from our spawn. He has collected some sperm solution from each of the five males that we had spawn out, and now he's adding the sperm. We'll let that sit and circulate for a while, and then we'll start checking for fertilization. We let the eggs incubate in a bucket for a couple hours, usually three to four. Once all the eggs have metamorphosized and we see them up and swimming, we will determine the stocking density we want to add to the tank. After fertilization, we'll let them sit in the bucket for a while to make sure that they start um, multiplying their cells. They'll go from one cell to multiple cells and then eventually they'll go into static tanks where they will stay until we harvest them. It takes typically 14 to 16 days for us to be able to hit the petty veliger stage, which is the stage that we want to be able to give to the DMR so they can set it on shell or culch. Once we know they are ready for harvest, we filter them out onto a finer screen pile all the larvae down into a small group and that way we can add them to the way we harvest the larvae, which is simply a damp coffee filter and damp paper towel. With this, we can put them in a Ziploc bag and store them in a fridge for five to seven days. This uh, allows DMR to hold on larvae longer and uh, they can set intervals of them setting the larvae. This morning we're heading out to do oyster dredging. Dredging is the most popular form of oyster production. Um, it's where you actually take a metal dredge, they drag the bottom, and pull the oysters up. Uh, the other is tonging, which is not done very often. Very labor intensive. They're both very labor intensive, but dredging is the most uh, used form of oyster production. Throw your dredges overboard, they're designed just like a rake with a bag on it. The oysters will hit the teeth on the rake, that's what they call them, rakes, and it'll throw them up, and when it throws them up, they go into the bag. You pick it up onto the side of the boat, it dumps on a table. You got a man on each end of the table, and they're actually what we call culling. They're chipping off all the rocks and the shells, throwing the good oysters up, throwing everything else that's bad back overboard. Wild reefs, you can only work the time that's allotted by the state, which in Mississippi, it varies because we go by too many different things. And it used to be, we opened up September the 1st, you worked all the way through to April 30th. 
Now, I see the sometimes five, 10, 15, 20 days where we used to have months. The private reefs you can work any time of the year as long as the state don't have it closed like the Bonacary Spillway opened up, the water got bad, they closed the areas. But if they don't close the areas, we don't have a size limit. We can catch any size oyster off the least we want. And we can move anything off of it that we want. Roughly about how many oysters or how many pounds go in a bag? You have legal measures. Mississippi has a measure. Louisiana has a measure. Texas has a measure. Alabama uses a hamper. They're different sizes. I was typically about 300 oysters will make, it can't be over 300 oysters to a sack until make the legal count. They average about 100 to 110 pounds per sack. Once the oysters are dredged, they're sacked, they're brought in by boat, which they're gonna be unloaded on through conveyors, loaded on trucks, and from there, they'll be shipped all over the country. So next time you eat an oyster, this may be where they came from. Crystal Sea Seafood is an oyster processing plant in Past Christian. We buy oysters off of local boats across the Gulf Coast and also from other dealers. We bring them back to our processing plant. At that time, we shuck them so that all the people can eat the wonderful gumbos and fried oysters. We also box them whole for half-shell restaurants to be able to shuck at the bars. Our oysters are distributed all over the country. What we're doing when we're grading the oysters in the whole shell is we're looking for oysters that are uniform in size and that have the right look to be put on a plate to be eaten raw. The clusters would be set aside so that every oyster that goes into a box that goes to a half shell style restaurant, they're all gonna be uniform. They're not going to have clusters, they're not going to have empty shells, they're not going to have dead oysters. We're going to have 35 pounds or 100 oysters that are usable. We're going to pack those up into 8 ounce containers, which is a half of a pint, all the way up to an 8 pound bucket. In the winter time in our prime season, we are opening and processing about 800 sacks a day. Two to 300 in the summertime. Um, oysters aren't in season in the summertime, so they have a lot more regulations on the fishing of them. So we just don't have as many oysters available. And people are thinking about other things like shrimp and crabs during the summertime. For our IQF process, what we do is we take the top shell off of the oyster and leave the natural liquor in. We put it on a tunnel freezer that moves along at about 10 minutes for the oysters to come out of the other side. The temperature is minus 85 or 90 degrees. At the very end of the process, we're gonna lightly mist it with plain water, nothing added to it. That helps to preserve the freshness in the freezer.
And that's all the time we have for this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. Join us again next time for more exciting adventures. Until then, I'm Pamela Weaver. And I'm Kevin Meacham. See, See you outdoors. outdoors. Time will spend